we, yeah, we had, we had hundreds of people coming round, including students, uh, freelancers, other production companies, agencies, brands, who uh, were able to see what the robot did, what virtual production was, which is another, the whole another topic that that I do a lot with, but how. AI is mixed into all of these, but not in a way of replacement, but in a way of augmenting for either the value of uh, agility, uh, sustainability, or literally cost reduction. With AI FM. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to Creatives with AI. Today we have a very special guest, somebody that I've known for a couple of years now, I think, met in the creative uh, advertising marketing agency world as a as a consultancy client of mine. Uh, this is, and correct me if I get this name wrong, uh, uh, James Pichard. Hopefully I've got that name. Close correctly. enough. <laughs> um, Close terrible enough. with names. Um, who is a creative technologist uh, and founder of the Visual, visual uh, Content Consultancy. Welcome, James. Hello, thank you for having me. Thank you. That's cool. It's really uh, yeah. exciting to have you on. I really want you to, um, the technology side is something I haven't been talking enough about with some of my others. They've been more the, the artistry side. So I'm really excited to have you on. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit of your background and tell us what, why you're here today and what you've got to talk about with regards to AI and creativity? Yeah, no worries. Well, um I suppose my journey started, uh, God, 25 years ago now um, uh, I'm from an engineering background. So uh, I, I moved from engineering into into CGI when we were first doing things like CAD CAM software and uh, and we were doing things with, with automated um, cutting tools and everything. And I used to, my first um, initial role was, was looking at uh, oil rig components and things like that. And it was quite boring and it's quite... Uh, uh, quite um, specific and quite um, detailed, but I was always fascinated by CG. So um, the the CG element, when you apply it to um, uh, filmmaking or uh, or creative endeavors, that that was in its infancy. That was that was kind of like at the time uh, where Toy Story first came out. Um, that was my first introduction to um, quality CG done from a storytelling perspective. And I think that was that was the key jump for me, where I went straight away from there into a creative uh, uh, a position, really. Uh, and then for the past twenty years, I've been agency side, I've been production side, uh, and I've kind of uh, built myself into into a, a position where uh, I'm helping to support that content generation, that content production pipeline for uh, advertising and marketing purposes. So the AI then was not a, a weird jump then for you to go from what you'd been what you've been doing into it's almost like the CGI was the the prequel part of what we now know AI to be. So mm -hmm. talk to me about you know you've obviously been in the industry of creating um, amazing content for a really really long time. Tell me a, a little bit more about how you're seeing the impact that AI is having on your industry uh, at the moment? Uh, well, I, I don't think it'll be any surprise, but AI is the, 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 the word of the day, the word of the year, the word of the last two or three years. And that's all based on generative AI, specifically generative AI, AI as of the last three to four years. But the biggest thing for, for my industry, for the creative industry, but also like sales and marketing and advertising and marketing industries, is how that is shortcutting so much of the uh, production process. It's shortcutting that, that it's creating the agility and the personalization that uh, marketers have been screaming for, for for decades, really. But it's also shortcutting that time to delivery. It's creating something that... Um, uh, is it is going to be demanded by by marketers constantly uh without the the usual or the traditional approach to to planning that that carries a huge amount of risk as well to be honest um uh but it's also the lowest barrier to entry a good example of that is something like um when i first started in agency we used to have headshots done we'd have the headshots done almost 
every six months because the agency was growing that much that you had to basically set up a studio, uh, bring in a photographer, that photographer had run that for, for a, um, a multi-day scenario, bringing in people every 15 minutes and doing that kind of thing. These days, you must have all seen whether you're um, uh, really a, a adapted AI or whether you're, you're just dipping your toe in. You must have seen things like, you know, professional headshot or something like that. And these things are being taken over by that. It's not because of the fact that it was a creative endeavor. It's because actually when you weigh up the cost of the staff for 15 minutes, each one going in there, the cost of setting up that, the faff of doing it, Ooh. it is much quicker. And it is, if it hits about 80% of its value in terms of the quality of the shot, then it's fit for purpose. And that's the key differential that we need to start, or we will talk about later on today, I'm sure, is kind of the... The, the differential between true creativity, true advertising, above the line beauty, and the below the line fit for purpose that needs to be there at that point. It's interesting because it's a question that I've had in conversations, not just on here, but in general, with you know that that fine line between using AI from an efficiency perspective and what is the mm. I guess the balance of making sure you're still being super creative because sometimes people are questioning can efficiency still ensure creativity what what's your view on that um yes uh but I I have to say that everything I say with AI is always an augmentation it's always part of the process uh, and a lot of the the work that I do with the brands and the specifically the agencies on how we sell uh, or how we integrate AI is it becomes a hybrid part of the creative process. It's not the um, replacement of, displacement of. It's the uh, um, it's part of the rollout. It's part of the um, uh, the pipeline of delivery, uh, and that that's kind of the the bit where when you start to look at it a little bit deeper and why I absolutely love it. When you start to look at it really deeply, you can kind of say right. I can replace that component of the creative process, that component of the production process with an automation rather rather than thinking about an AI as, as like a robot or anything. It's an automation process that used to take me that long to do. And now if I can get it to there, that means I can spend more time on the creative or on the other part. It's, it, it's, a, it's, it's a way of speeding things up. I've got great examples of that, really, when we think about like the production process of um, uh, film stuff like we're, we're literally working on a project now where uh, there is a, a huge recolor of a of an object and the recolor of that object used to be done by something called rotoscoping which anybody in the industry that's from a composition or a compositor or an editing standpoint their their first move into the industry will be as a rotoscoper which is basically just masking out every frame of something, 25 frames a second for as long as that piece is. Uh, whereas for the last you know, five years, we've had uh, machine learning tools and now really good AI tools that are able to segment and essentially rotoscope um, content for us, which means that we're offsetting those components that were hella boring, really, um, to... Uh, to, to 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 the to the AI and spending our time where we ought to be, which is getting the recolor right, making sure that the narrative is consistent, and making sure that 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 continuity carries on throughout the piece. That, that's quite interesting because it brings up a a question then, uh, which I think we were going to talk about a little bit later on, but I'm going to ask it now because it's come up. Um, does that mean that if those roles, rotoscoping, you said? Uh, uh, ones that you go in as an entry level. What's going to happen in time to those roles? Like, what will be the new entry level? Do you think it, that that is a bit that you know? Uh, as a consultant, I can kind of do what I what what I want. I I talk in with brands and agencies and production companies and kind of help them get ready for it. But what I've noticed is I'm spending a lot of time with. Um, um, universities, colleges, uh, and, and actually helping them framework um, better modules on integrating, not an AI module run by a guy who, who, who understands AI, but a creative, a production, a content generation, a, 
a, a filmmaking module that instead of just teaching how to handle a camera, it's how to handle a camera and then how to integrate an AI framework into that. Because I, I 100% um, agree that irrespective of whether people um, adapt and adopt it or not, it is coming. Uh, and if um, the creatives that are coming into the industry now are not able to adapt to that or at least uh, integrate it into their workflow, they are behind. And when you look at it from an un educated mind like a marketer or not an uneducated uncreative mind uh mm -hmm. someone who basically so needs social content yeah I, I i need something in my feed uh, that's usually where the the the, the um, new creatives and the new producers the new content generators the new marketeers that's where they start with creating stuff that is feed content that is kind of just scroll through the the always on the evergreen stuff that we do uh, that's perfect. That's the stuff that in in um, agencies you put all of the guys as they start because the risk value to the agency, the risk value to the brand and the client is quite low. We can always yeah. fix it; it's fine. But it's a good way to get your head into the into the space. And if the more and more of that content that is now automated, whether it's AI or not, the more that becomes automated, even with personalization and everything else, the less there is for them to do. Therefore. The runs of those ladders where I first started, where where, where many um, uh, students are now entering the the industry, where they first started, it's just not there. It's not, it's not going to be there. It's there now, but give it another couple of years, probably not. And so yeah. that's kind of where we need to either, um, with the universities, jump them a few la runs or change the way that we handle things like uh, apprentices, uh, apprenticeships uh work experience and things like that and almost give them a a really regular kick up the bum in terms of how you how, how you handle uh ai and creativity it, it's definitely not the end of creativity it's the it, it, it's the acceleration it's the evolution into something else and it, again like it, it's just shortcutting if you look at uh, a good another good example for that is uh something like canva um, some of you, whether you're techie or not, may have heard of Canva. Now, Canva is newish to the scene, five years maybe. But before that, you'd have to have waited for me to do it in Photoshop or somebody else to do it in, in After Effects. Canva has shortcutted so much of that and without AI. And now with AI, Canva shortcut all of those components. But it's not the creativest thing. It's not the most original thing. It's template-driven. But it is shortcutting those actions that used to be handled by junior members of staff and uh, 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 new work experience and stuff like that. So that's kind of where um, universities uh, and and people joining the industry at around sixteen to eighteen really have to, you know, get their get their get acting in, in in order and and um, and reach out to to places, smaller agencies, bigger agencies, and and production companies to get immersed in what's that next run afterwards and how to how they can run the machine um well in the last month or two we've managed to teach um 24 year olds how to do um uh, commercial lauras and uh and fine tuning in ai models in like a week uh wow. and it was lo it's lovely to see because they're basically just they're using the frameworks and it's basically just teaching technology, but it's teaching how and why to use that. And I think that's quite key. It's a context. Alongside a you know, creative thing. Yeah, yeah, the context yeah. of it, but also allowing them to just, it, it's almost like it's another uh, how to use a camera. It's another how to light a scene, but alongside their skill set. Are you finding that um, smaller businesses are picking this thing up quicker than the bigger ones, or are they kind of, both at the same time, or is there a a lag? Um, for a better word. Well, uh, uh, interestingly, if if you ask me as a consultant to agencies, I would say that the bigger ones are hamstrung certainly by literally their scale, uh, by the fact that everyone can be an expert in AI, and very few really are when you start talking about um, how to integrate it properly. 
everyone can copy and paste and it's almost like if if i go back to my early days of like um uh 2010 and stuff when i was hiring teams in in agencies for creative processes i could see if a showreel came to me that i could see what tutorials they'd use to make the showreel but only because i knew of them all right uh, and and i knew of them all and i could say right you you basically just copied that tutorial if you'd applied some inspiration, some aspiration, some creative endeavor to it. Yeah, okay, that's cool. That's how you learn. If you just copied it, if you didn't know that that was a tutorial, you'd think that guy was a genius. But <laughs> because you know it's a tutorial, you know that actually it's a step-by-step process and there's not. Uh, so so it, it, it's realizing and recognizing those components in there as well and saying, right, uh, get that person to... to, to um, to understand the framework and then um, use it from a creative perspective, break it, re-engineer it. And smaller agencies are able to do that quicker. Smaller agencies are able to do that for their clients quicker than the big network agencies at the moment. I'm not, you know, throwing uh, throwing daggers at big network agencies, but they hide under a, a shroud with this AI stuff. Don't get me wrong. There'll be teams of them there working on it, but, how that properly integrates into their service offering is still a little, a wee bit murky. Uh, mm. Whereas the smaller guys are um, are able to adapt this and align and apply that to client briefs and client uh, campaigns much, much quicker. So I would say that the gap is shrinking between those, but only because that proprietary software that as a big agency man from back in the day, our agency has proprietary tools to do this, this, and this. Those <laughs> are more available now. Well, yeah. I, I literally have said those lines yeah, so no, many times in pictures. I'm laughing because me too. <laughs> yeah. And all it's done in, in the last five, ten years is uh, is enable us to uh, um, remove those proprietary tools, those, the, those, those things that were out of the reach of so many of us, and say, you know, we all have a, a you know a level playing field now. So if you're from, uh, if if you've got the best creative or the most efficient this, or uh, it, it it's built on like a, a starting to be built on a relationship game. It's built on how you deal with the client, how you um, deliver the best creative, how you deliver the best results from an agency point of view. Yeah. Um, uh, and and that that's quite inspiring. That's that's one of the reasons why I think for me consulting is is the way forward because of the fact that I can. I can help multiple agencies, whether it's PR, whether it's uh, SEO, or whether it's just integrated, to get to that level quickly and understand why. Uh, and, and, you know, the big agencies are doing that, but just slower. Yeah. I think what's really exciting about about that is that, um, and I've, I've talked to the, some of my other guests about this already, is that it allows because there's a little bit of a fear of, oh, the AI is going to, you know, take away my creative role. Actually, but what you're saying is going to enhance anybody that is super good. It's going to... Yeah, take, yeah. Yeah. Which I think is quite exciting. Um, you don't, you don't really, we don't really know what else is going to come from it. There's, mm. there's a good analogy that I sometimes use when talking to agencies, which is, uh, in the in the early forties, the displacement of of sewers um, because machinery came in to uh, to change the so the the fashion industry didn't die. It basically because we were able to bring in this machinery that was able to deal with different fabrics and that allowed us to bring in other fabrics that created an entire unique fashion industry um that, that that basically accelerated into areas that in the early you know the 1930s 40s 50s nobody really knew and nobody had a, a vision as to what that would be i feel like that's quite similar here we don't know what automating those phases will do to how people experience and engage with content yeah i think i i love the idea and this gives me, uh, again, I'm quite excited about this and gives me hope that we've seen this pattern before. It happened in photography. It happened when we came along. It, you know, there's all these things. The the smart people, the people that will probably come to you and go help us get to the next stage, 
they understand that it's an a, it's a change in adjustment rather than a because there's still a lot of rhetoric out there about my job is going to be done and actually you just need yeah. to adjust rather than thinking that's it so and that that's usually driven by necessity that's usually driven mm. for me anyway from agencies is driven by we've had a briefing from an agency who we work with who said how are we handling ai or how are we doing this can we ai this uh, and invariably the 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 agency will look at it and go oh, i don't know also should we be doing that and i um i think half the time half of them are no at that stage should, mm. should we ai this is should we automate that process uh, and a lot of the time if you are in the weeds climbing through and actually trying to do it you don't look above and go actually there's not really a point in doing it unless it hits that critical volume or that critical mass of why we're doing it then um uh, a manual process or just a machine learned and automated process is better than applying a proper AI to it. Uh, it can shortcut, you know, it's shortcutting so much of, of my uh, outreach of my uh, initial integration and stuff and my interpretation of data, but it's only then giving me, it's like a, uh, a member of staff giving you, this is what I think. What do you think? You still have mm -hmm. to make that, that interpretation uh, for yourself. Uh, and, uh, and stand behind what you're saying as well, which is quite um, uh, quite unnerving for some of the smaller agencies to, to do. Uh, yeah. But, I, you know, it, it, it's happening, isn't it? It is happening. I mean, you have a, a strong focus on the visual elements of AI, obviously. Tell me more in detail what that actually means to you and sort of what that focus is. Well, making you focus on <laughs> well i i think um yeah i mean it, it focuses me because of the fact that i i feel like um ai is is discussed certainly in in circles where you know people are just talking about ai for the for you know like they talk about the weather or yeah. something like that ai has this uh concept of right it's, it's gpt it's this it's this it's this uh, and realistically there's a lot of people building ai agents there's a lot of people doing these things what's interesting is how the technology is kind of the same but when I focus, and I focus specifically on visual components, that's kind of the back end understanding of how uh, diffusion tools work, how we can cross um, uh, pollinate different technologies that, uh, for all intents and purposes, are still the exact same technologies from when I was, you know, doing CG way back in twenty years ago. The, the way that I would approach a CGI uh, brief and the way that I, I used to do it with the agency was um, I'd send around a couple of apples and I go, which one's real? And that kind of thing's still happening now. It's just with AI. This is a real yeah. apple. This is an AI apple. But I used to do that 20 years ago. And when I look at how we integrate uh, AI, uh, sorry, AI, um, CGI into um, video production, into creative campaigns and stuff, the way that you integrate them together is actually the exact same as the way that you control AI uh, integration, so, so proper hybrid integration. And that's also the way that you control it. So um, one of the big things I always talk about when we're talking about integrating into proper um, uh, commercial use cases uh, is uh, that controllability, that consistency, and that continuity, um, uh, consistent character, things like that, all of those components. Um, that you can't get from third-party tools. You know, Midjourney is great. Please get involved in it. It's brilliant. But what happens when we want to sell on those components? What happens when we want to uh, integrate that into a very specific campaign? And that's where I'm actually pulling a lot more from the heritage of, of CGI as to how we need to block that off, create this depth map, then do this, then do this. And it's all just a node-based framework. Uh, and 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 all the way back to um, uh, engineering days, it, it comes into something called um, like the innovation pipeline, CI/CD, constant iteration, constant development. In a in a, in a normal project, there's a start point and an end point. Uh, in this sort of thing, I've done away with the start point, done away with the end point, and we have this middle modular thing that is built to change. It's constantly changing and constantly iterating. 
uh, when a new toolkit comes out, when we need something else from, uh, uh, we need it to do something else. It's basically a, a homogenous living node-based framework. And that's the bit that means that if uh, a new mo uh, model, a new LLM comes out from, I don't know, uh, Meta or this or that or, or, or any one of them, uh, or a client comes with a very specific uh, um, LLM that they've developed, uh, then by integrating that in, you're using the LLM as the brain, but not the eyes. And that's kind of key okay. from a visual perspective is um, uh, the, the brain, the, 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 the ability to process and diffuse is not um, the, the bit that we're using the LLM for. It's just the ability to power. It's the engine. Everything else is 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 all controllable and slightly smaller. So it's still got elements of AI in it, but they're all they can all therefore then be local, which is the key for when you start doing it commercially, is being able to control those pipelines and deliver the consistency. Which I think for brands, uh, for, so for for agencies, that's kind of a little bit like the future. Uh, that's like um, uh, if you are an agency person, how do you onboard a client? Usually, the one of the first points is brand guidelines mm. and how how we interpret those brand guidelines that are written out. I've written many of these before, and we've added in components to brand guidelines for brands because you know movement has a um, has a brand style, a momentum, and things like Ooh. that. Acceleration, deceleration, all of those sound, sonics, all of those things have have key brand capabilities to, to trigger something in your mind, and so therefore they go in the brand guidelines, but when you start to use AI to uh, augment that, you're basically training the AI to deliver that consistency. Um, and when we see the brand guidelines, I look at a page that says, this is the photography style. Well, I think in the future, this is the photography data set. If we start, to, if we start at that point, then we can either generate new data sets to support the activity that we've been brought on to do, or we augment their actual data set uh, to apply context and variables like um, Christmas, Easter, uh, you know, the summer campaign, things like that. So the, there's ways that it, it kind of overlaps and it works the exact same. It's just a little bit different and it's a little bit like right, where the interpretation was is now a data set where you can still do the interpretation. There's just more data to play with. I think that's probably quite deep, but anyway. No, 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 I, I, no, I love that. I mean, you know, you and I in the past have talked a lot about data. I love data. Um, I think what's exciting about that, and I do, you know, over the years having worked in the agency world for uh, several decades now, um, I know that consistency is often a challenge when you've got uh, marketing directors changing, brand directors changing, managers, whatever. Then you've got the agency you know, you've got designers change and, you know, there's always a, do you think that that then fixes that whole issue of different humans coming in and out? Does that ensure the consistency much more, do you think? Mm. From a visual and creative. I, I, and I don't want to be, I, I don't want to be the guy that sticks to the brand guidelines all the time as well. We want a, <laughs> a, an evolution of the brand. We don't want yeah. to stay the exact same. We want that personality. It's more, um, it's more the mistakes that often happen from human um, uh, briefing that this will very quickly solve in terms of, um, uh, I I, there's a good example. I built a very, a very small version of this, but um, an AI agent for a brand guidelines. So uh, when you think about um, uh, like a big campaign that has multiple touch points, it's got you know, TV advert, above the line, below the line, uh, printed media, uh, uh, loads of different digital out of home and all these other e-commerce things. You're basically, as the agent, kind, um, as the agency, kind of throwing them to other different production companies and, and various other creative things and trying to keep creative control so that you get consistency over that campaign. Yeah. Yeah. But what you get then is uh, questions back either to the marketing team at the brand or to, to, to the, um, the creative team at the agency where they're going, oh, can I have the vector logo? Can I have this? Where would text go? Because this is a long banner that's going in a petrol station or something like that. Mm -hmm. Now, if they can ask that of uh, an, an AI agent, especially when we're talking as well, multinational, EMA and all the rest of that, EMA, mm -hmm. uh, 
that thing is on all the time. And it can say, and I, I, I built it so that basically I can say, what what are you doing it for? Oh, it's a banner. Oh, it's a printed banner. Okay, here is the um, graphics uh, for that component. Here is the print vector files, and it's not a JPEG. Uh, here is all of the other components that are right for that. And let me have a look at the text. I can help you write that in the brand tone of voice quickly because it's it's invariably like just a very small thing. So it might just be how do how do they say how does that brand say fifty percent off? Uh, how how do they in uh, you know uh, imbue that information in a branded style? So it's not it's not like full on campaign copywriting or anything like that. It's yeah. just reference and interpretation of a small thing that used to take. You know, if somebody sent that across and went, "Oh, can I have the logo?" It might be twenty minutes before we send that back. And even mm -hmm. worse if it's a marketeer more, who's yeah. rushing up their thing. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. You can be twenty-four <laughs> hours, or they've gone on holiday, or whatever, and yeah. the entire campaign's at the risk of. Uh, of missing the deadlines and missing that all important, um, uh, you know, launch window where you get that that repetition of viewing. How many uh, times with things like this? It is, it's, <laughs> I know. Well, God, yeah, I know. Um, many times that you've tried to solve that problem to ensure yeah. that you don't miss the deadline or you don't miss the, that that key window because you know we're paying a lot of money for these things and where yeah. you know, when you've got. Um, above the line tv stuff going out you can't miss any of these opportunities with different touch points across yeah. the uh, across the the media landscape do you think that also well, yeah. uh, affords the opportunity of i don't see it a lot these days but you do see it sometimes where there's a last intentional last minute um piece of creative either for an ad or a piece of content or what have you because of something that's in the press and they they can quickly flip it do you think that's going to enable that uh immediate response to the zeitgeist zeit and the yeah that agility yeah agility and, and reactive nature um mm -hmm. So a lot of the stuff, if I'm helping in-house teams, a lot of the stuff that I build has that 20% reactive element in it. And so expect reactivity, expect demure, or expect all of these trends that come out that need to be capitalized on really, really quickly. Uh, and you can still do that if your planning is, is, is top notch. You can do it in a way that enables us to build uh, either sub or little fine-tuning components, context changes. Um, and, and the reason I talk about this in terms of AI or CG or anything like that is because the less, um, uh, the less destructive, and when I say destructive, I don't mean it in, in, in an explosive thing. I mean more like when you um, compress down a TV advert to this and you don't have how it was made, you basically have the end asset. But actually, if you have the framework of how it was made available to you to change a hairstyle there because it's quite funny or to add something to a T-shirt here mm. is actually quite easy to do if I have the understanding here. And in AI, non-destructive means I have the ability to recycle and reuse anything we've created. So a lot of my work is building frameworks that do not have destructive elements so that even if the campaign is built really, really quickly or really expensively and we can't afford to reshoot that, we might not have to because we can augment, augment that with either digital virtual production, uh, digital twinning tools, CGI, or even now AI, which means that the, the, the content remains open for the, uh, films do this basically with um, product placement product placement, language variables in, in terms of the background, signs and stuff like that, we can have those open now in or in advertising and marketing as well so that we can make personal, regional or, uh, or, or language-based um, context changes but keep the essence of the narrative the exact same. Yeah. And that's the key part. It's still the same creative. It's still the same message. It's just that subconscious twig or subconscious... Um, recognition to me that oh yeah i know that place or oh that would look good in my kitchen or something like that those are the subconscious triggers that are actually probably more powerful than um than some of the other bits i think what is um that's just reminded me of something like when um i've worked in big global agencies one of the challenges they've had is going from global to local right so going you've got your yeah 
global strategy, you've got your global creative idea and thinking, but it does need, in order to hit the audience that it's hitting in individual regions, countries, what have you, languages even, um, they often had a challenge with how do you take it from the big idea down into the individual areas. Does that, does that fix that then? Does the AI uh, part Some, of... Somewhat. Somewhat. Yeah, I would say somewhat because I mean, uh, if you think about fashion, uh, again another an, another live example, diversity and inclusion is really really difficult to deal with. If you were to shoot something, let's say we're shooting a T-shirt across the breadth of um, uh, uh, of of you know hu human uh, culture, um, especially if it's a global brand or something like that, it's really difficult to represent that in a cost-effective way without having um, uh, representation for just about everything. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it's really hard to do that. Um, uh, so most brands don't or can't. Whereas with an, with an augmented AI scenario, we start to be able to have that uh, personal or subconscious rec uh, representation a little bit more. Now that's not to say, that's why I say somewhat, it's not to say that that's now wiping out the need for, for creating models or, 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 or building, um, not building, sorry, using models or using locations or things like that. It has to be a, um, a hybridized uh, process and, and there's, there's elements to fix along that pipeline. But it means that uh, a contextual personalization becomes more uh, 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 capable more uh, plausible in uh, both below the line content and above the line content. And of course, uh, regionality, uh, you know, uh, seasonality and things like that uh, are, are, are exactly just the exact same. It's part of that. Uh, and the same deal with um, very, very big uh, multinational brands where they have departments working across different uh, regions. The way to con control and connect those is to, is to, work in a way that allows that openness, allows that um, uh, regionalization really, really effectively without having to go out and reshoot something or go out and redo it again and do it again. And then there's levels of interpretation there which might uh, affect the core essence of that message. Um, so it, it, it's, it's really weird to say that that's, that's helping, but it, it will help in terms of making... Um, advertising more uh relatable i think yeah it makes sense it does make sense um so one of the things uh sorry sort of jumping uh conversation a little bit in a slightly different direction although probably not um you and i when we were chatting before we jumped on you told me that you'd been doing something called promo 24 with a um uh with tungsten media um, who I understand you're a non-exec director for and um, have some level of investment in as well. Um, tell me what Promo24 is, because I think that would be of quite interest to everybody, what you've been doing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I sent an ex um, when, when I when I joined there, uh, I, I joined there and I said to them, um, they, have a, they have this thing called a, a robotic arm, um, and it's called a motion control unit. And... Um, not many agencies would know that exists, but you've all seen the work. You've seen every McDonald's advert, every high-end FMCG, beautiful sweeping movements. You've all seen its work, but um, they 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 have one, and it's in Leeds. It's it's up north, uh, but uh, there's only one. There's only one in, um, in in Yorkshire, and there's there's one in Manchester, and then there's some in London. Uh, and I said, "What well, do you do? You shout about this? How you use this? How it?" Um, augments how you approach uh, content generation, content creation, um, TV adverts, stuff like that. And, and they, they don't. But equally, they, they didn't. Um, that, that, that is the framework of knowing this, this robot exists, that actually when you apply other technologies to it, and of course AI, yeah. uh, it becomes really quite powerful and therefore then lowers that barrier to, uh, to entry so that it's not just reserved for your big McDonald's adverts and things, actually we can start to um, use this from a, a creative uh, standpoint uh, for various other stuff. So the point was that we would basically, like a Stark Expo, I basically sent a GIF of uh, Iron Man to the guys. I'm like, right, what if we just open the doors? What if we just open the doors and we tell them, we lift the hood up and show them exactly how we do all of these things? 
because it, in in fairness, it's it's building that um, excitement and that invigoration, that aspiration, inspiration to the creatives, both in 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 the north and in London. We had a few come up from London and the students to uh, to start creating things with the vision that don't worry about how we make it, we'll just make it. Uh, and um, and so we basically brought this um, expo together, uh, and we yeah we had we had hundreds of people coming round, including students, uh, freelancers, other production companies, agencies, brands, who uh, were able to see what the robot did, what virtual production was, which is another the whole another topic that that okay. I do a lot with, but how. AI is mixed into all of these, but not in a way of replacement, but in a way of augmenting for either the value of uh, agility, uh, sustainability, or literally cost reduction speed. Uh, and, um, uh, and and all of the, the pieces of work that we were showing were like, if we can integrate AI into this section here, that means we don't need to do this, which means that we don't need to do this, which means that the barrier to enter the price point that you need is here. It also means we don't need to uh, go to that location, hire this bunch of crew or do this or do that um, at that point. So it means that it becomes much, much cheaper for them. It becomes much more sustainable for them, which you know uh, is essentially the, the mission that we've been on for, I've been on for, for five, 10 years is how can mm -hmm. I make it more, uh, I mean, efficiency and sustainability, they just sit next to each other. Yeah. If it's more efficient, it's likely more sustainable. Um, uh, but, you know, track all of that and then show how how that looks and how that works. Was this year the uh, first yeah, year? Yeah, so... Uh, yeah, sorry, go. No, I was just going to say, was this the first year that this you did this uh, opening up to everybody kind mm -hmm. of? Thing? And how are you going to uh, do it? Yeah, then? yeah. And yeah, we're gonna do it every six months. It was a mission and a half. It was an absolute mission and a half. We'll but, put some notes uh, somewhere. We'll I, put some links and things down. <laughs> yeah, please. Yeah, <laughs> just give me six months. Just give me six months to do it again. But but I think the the interesting part is that there was no secrets. There's nothing there that you can't see. I will send you the softwares. I will send you how to do it. I'll show you how we color correct technology between um uh cameras and uh virtual screens or physical screens or whatever uh i'll show you how we create backgrounds and everything because realistically the more that we get involved and engaged in this as as an industry as yorkshire as as a creative industries the more people that will validate that that is a um a viable methodology and the less the less we will end up you know flying across to africa to do a shoot in in january because it's um uh, you know, because it's warm there, and that's yeah. kind. Of, that's a very real world example. Is kind of that those kind of things are are quite commonplace uh, and, uh, and and quite uh, unsustainable when it comes to um, uh, both budgets and uh, and the environment. Uh, yeah. If we're more clever, uh, we can deliver the exact same thing, uh, but in a more efficient way. That's, I find that really exciting. Please invite me to the next one um, and and uh, let us know about it as well because we can always, I guess, tell people about it um, on our social medias. So um, we we touched gently on the sort of 20 years ago CGI throughout the conversation. Um, tell me yeah. a, a very specific, I don't want to say specifically, the journey that you took from going from there to where you are with the AI, what... What sort of got you to where you are at the moment to what you're doing with AI and how you're, I mean, there must have been other touch points along that journey that kind of got you, yep. you know, to where you are and what you're doing with the, I love the fact that it's robot and AI, my brain just went Terminator. But anyway. Uh, <laughs> but, yeah. but do you, do you know, there's, there's a good story there as well, actually. Um, we had a, a few guys that um, that came from different industries. Uh, there's a guy that actually came from uh, agricultural, um, um, agricultural deep tech, something or other. Anyway, ordinarily, we would never speak. He's a completely separate industry to us. Uh, and I, I've known him from doing some talks on the, the AI circuit generally. But he came and we started to break down his infrastructure of what he does and basically his toolkit is uh for for agriculture which is a huge uh climate um uh, uh climate uh, problem really 
um, he uh, automates uh, electric robots, or his company creates electric robots that pull weeds out. And how do those robots detect the weeds uh, in in fields, you know, and automate themselves so they do it all the time, twenty four seven? Well, um, the <laughs> they don't pull out the potatoes. Well, fingers crossed, they don't pull out the potatoes. But yeah, they basically weed the the ground and they detect all of those things. And, and by the way, there's augmentation for different types of soil, different types of sun covering, different uh, you know all of those factors. And, and actually, when you boil down the tech, how does it work? It uh, they uh, train it on the local weeds. That training data it creates a three D model. That three D model gives you a volume. That gives you a volume for how wide to reach in oh, and wow. pull the weed out, including including the uh, the root system. Um, then uh, they have uh, computer vision with um, segmentation. But when we uh, to, to figure out what's a weed and what's a potato and that sort of thing, and then basically upload the the software and away it goes, and then track and understand the, the validation of, of whether it's is it successful or not. When we finished the promo event, we went through our tech and they were exactly the same, oh, wow. exactly the same process. We um, train uh, products and uh and, and certain things for e-commerce use uh so basically we uh, as a production company they basically uh create consistency for what, what's called lauras which basically are take a product and make sure that it it, it doesn't give you that six finger ai thing it's right. perfect every time the generation is perfect every time and it's controllable and local that's the exact same as them that then creates a 3d module uh, uh, uh object which is geometry exact same as the um, the agricultural thing that then gives you the ability to move a robot around a physical space in order to capture other content lifestyle content stuff like that that's the same as the agricultural guys and then the segmentation enables us to do color correction based on physical and virtual components that's the same as the so realistically like the, it was down to the actual algorithms we were using were exactly the same it's it's so odd but that's that's a good example of how AI has exponentially exploded mm. because industries that are not connected and never were connected are now using the same toolkits, the same approaches and the same technologies in order to uh, do different things. And that, that was one of the key bits for me that was these are all uh, essentially three dimensional um, components, how I would have segmented. 3D things way back when, 20 years ago, is exactly the same way you do it now in AI. It's still the same output. It's just an AI is defining that and how you define where that, that one component in the string of things happens, but it's the same. It's so odd. It's so odd. It is odd. I think what's, what's quite a big learning from that, and I've often done this um, when I've been uh, working in agencies and uh, trying to come up with different pitch ideas and that kind of thing is like look at industries that are completely nothing to do with you like completely random for inspiration that is a prime example of like I would never have thought that those two uh, industries would have had alignments when it came to no. augmentation and AI like you guys must have looked at each other and gone what <laughs> Um, you know? It's almost like a little bit of kinship kind of thing. It's like, how did you solve this bit? Oh, I did this. Yeah, we did that. And it's, you know, it, it, yeah. you, you even do this um, because AI is this big explosive thing and you end up, I end up talking to people across the world. It's so odd to see that as all, uh, I spoke to someone in Indonesia the other day um, uh, from a really big company um, and they're an animation company. Uh, and they were solving the same sort of things in the same sort of ways. And we're asking a, a little question. I was like, oh, yeah, just do this. <gasps> oh, yeah. And it was almost like that light bulb moment. But the, the language is the exact same. You know, different languages, different cultures, different use cases. But essentially, the, the this AI language is, is, is one language. Mm. It's odd. <laughs> and it's developing itself, really, because... Nobody, I think, is necessarily yet sitting down and go, this is the language. It clearly is just developing as it's gr yeah. growing organically. That's kind of cool. And and replacing those steps that we don't want to do anyway. So the segmentation <laughs> is replacing um, rotoscoping. Uh, converting into 3D is replacing retopology. 
um, uh, uh, data sets is replacing uh, uh, 3D modeling in certain instances, not in every instance, but in certain instances, this is enabling us to shortcut those bits and get to what, from a creative standpoint, is important, the story. Yeah, I think uh, and it's come up in, like, a, you know, I keep doing this a lot. Um, it's come up in my other conversations with uh, creatives and artists on this sh show is is the it's a tool to enhance existing creativity, mm -hmm. which for a lot of people out there, there's a fear around AI. And for me, the more I'm learning and the more I'm uh, communicating with people like yourself, the less, well, I didn't really have a lot of fear around it anyway myself, but that it's just disappearing. Like for me, it's becoming more and more exciting yeah. and more creativity will come out rather than less. Well, let's go back to the, the CGI conversation again and say yeah. that when I started in in uh, in agency, like the, the 20 years ago, doing this Apple real CGI Apple, which one's the real one? The reason I was doing that is because people said uh, CG will never end up in, uh, in, in a price point and in a, a, a situation where we can use it for advertising and marketing purposes. Mm -hmm. I would absolutely guarantee that anyone in a small agency or a large agency wouldn't butt an eyelid now if we said that bit's going to be CG, that bit's going to be this, that bit's going to be that. Nobody bats an eyelid because that's right. fine. It's now a commercial uh, staple. It's a, a part of our standard toolkit is, is applying CG components. Now, that's the exact same as where AI is going to be. Not not in you know three years, five years, six months, less than that. Yeah. This is kind of like the augmentation of uh, of our toolkit. That's all. So we've talked about. Well, you've actually hit on the three to five years thing, which I think we've, to a certain degree, kind of covered what three but top line three to five years. What does that look like? And then what does ten years out? look like like if you're sort no. of in your mind projecting so three to five and then ten what does ai look like in three to five and then in ten okay. years time do you think well i've got a good example of how i've got this wrong loads of times as well uh <laughs> i used to do um augmented reality uh with uh 3d properties uh, for um a big house builder in 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 this country and I do massive AR things and say, trust me, AR is the future. And I've been saying that for 15 years now. Uh, and the reason for the barrier to entry with AR was that um, you had to download an app. So basically that that um, impression to engagement is cut by 60, 70% because nobody wants to download an app. But the minute that you can um, bypass that by having it become web AR, then that shortens that barrier, which means that a lot more people engage with it. And, the, and the, the technology has just been bubbling over in the background to make that more effective, more interesting, more engaging. And that's where you start to see things like, although they're all fake, you start to see a lot of those um, CGI dressing the Big Ben in a jacket sort mm. of scenario. All of those little campaigns are all fake, but we're getting to the point now where certain elements of that, that mixed reality, the MR, the, uh, where you're augmenting physical components, like maybe fashion or something, has a, a, a digital component to it, a digital personalization to it. We're now getting to the point now where really that is working. So when I say in AI, um, I, I think there's a huge level of personalization that can come from this. There's a huge level of um, customization in real time, and that's gonna that's gonna be the the key component for like things like. Um, uh, streaming technologies, when we engage with uh, streaming technologies and things like that, we've been doing uh, product placement, we've been doing contextual subconscious cues in films for years, but it's all manual to achieve that. Whereas in in, in a matter of uh, years, in a matter of a, f a few months, years maybe because of the timeline to build the, the actual story itself, we're talking about being able to augment that uh, based on uh, personal preference. So that's things like, I actually want to see uh, this story, Romeo and Juliet told to me in a sci-fi setting. I'd like to see this story told to me as though it was um, uh, an, an ancient battle in World War One. 
Now the the variety, the chain, the story is the same. The characters can be different. The language is different. The set is different. The uh, the wardrobe is different. Everything's different. But actually, all of those are controllable. And all of those in the future, I could see a world where you could actually make those in real time and have a complete control over uh, over how you engage with stories. So I'm a sci-fi geek. I would like I'd be told the same damn story that uh, I could be told in Renaissance times, but on a spaceship or something like that. That way, that way we get the essence of the story. We get the essence of the performance and stuff, but uh, the context of the environment, the landscape that it's, it's being presented in is, um, is, is up for interpretation. And I think that's quite, it's quite interesting. I think there'll be a lot of people that would hate on that, but it is quite interesting, right? You've seen it over the years in theatre though, where, you know, Shakespeare has been taken from its original format and taken into the modern, sometimes taken into um, sometime in the future, uh, what have you. So it's not that different. It'd be like taking Hamlet and putting it onto a, you know, a Star Wars kind of environment. What does that look like? You know, the, the stories, I mean, they always say that stories have got the same, is it five or six different scenarios that kind yeah. of generally goes on? Well, that's kind of, what that is, but taking it into a different different um, direction as far as stylistic is concerned. And I think the the uh, the other thing that is is bringing everything closer together is this this uh, content mix as well. There used there's there's always been this divide between uh, high end TV film stuff and the advertising and marketing industry, and I'm constantly pushing this one to here. As this one comes down in both budget and time to delivery, streaming, thanks for that kind of scenario. But there's kind of that overlap happening where as these get closer and closer together, they borrow techniques from each yeah. other. Uh, yeah. And so how you would have created high-end uh, TV in terms of dramas and things like that, or how you create long-form content and how you apply that to short-form content Look at YouTube, for example. Mm. Um, how that, uh, how the streaming, cap the streaming capability of that, and the engagement that they're getting on that on the big telly, as well as on uh, um, uh, mobile phone and, and laptop scenarios. L look at the the overlap that's happening there. It, it, it's it's the power of um, the story and the engagement in the characters and the way that it's told that's the important part. And the technologies are kind of just starting to 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 overlap together. And I think there's more of that to come with AI. Uh, shortening the barrier, it's stopping those big agencies from saying proprietary tech, and it's enabling more stories to be told uh, in, in w with variable budgets without being controlling it from um, you know Paramount Studios or whatever, where you have these um, uh, restrictions and, and and various other uh, influences that are stopping that story going out how how it should be told or how it was was written. So if that is what the future is going to look like, which I do agree with most of what you've said on that, I think you are you are right on that. I'll be I'll be backing you on that one. There was there was one uh, question I wanted to ask, which we did touch on earlier about uh, students and so forth, but future students. You and I were talking about um, uh, what what those students are going to need to to be doing, and you had a, a view on that, I think, didn't you? Oh gosh, yeah. I mean. I, I am I am genuinely not worried, but um, I, I'm conscious that 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 burying your head in the sand and there's there's a there's a term that everybody tends to use in AI circles is ostriching, where you can kind of get angry and it, it's almost like um, it's interesting. Oh, it's almost that. like those uh, the five stages of grief scenario as well, oh, okay. where people are going, nah, it won't it won't it won't make any impact. Yeah, it will it will stop this. It will stop this. But actually, get quickly to acceptance and um, and then open your eyes to actually how could I use it? It'd be almost like um, a a person who's always drawn on pencil being handed a bunch of paints and saying, actually, what what else can you do now that you have all of this capability? And with students. Um, I would say that uh, although you don't need to go to the nth level that I've discussed in this in this thing with uh, all all of the um, uh, controllable frameworks, you don't need to get to that level yet. But actually, understanding the very basics of what is capable and what is um, uh, um, 
out there for you to express that that creative uh, cap- um opportunity because let's face it that's your best time to do it university college and stuff mm. your brief is open do whatever um uh, uh, and the the learning stage in there is actually in learning both the traditional methodology but also what makes um your approach different to if somebody like a marketeer or a um somebody like a a, um, a randomer tries to make a film with chat gpt and various other uh, tools you can do it but we've seen those fail massively in the last six months because there's no emotion, no storytelling, no nothing. And there's also no hybrid use. It's just AI end to end. Uh, whereas what I'd say is as a, a creative coming into the industry, learn the essence of the traditional composition control for visuals, composition control, how to use a camera, what a lens means, depth of fields, all of these focus points, all of these the, the shot progressions and how you build a good act control and, and emotional arcs into your into your story, whether it's a TV advert or, or a full on short or anything. Uh, and then look at how AI can style it how um how you can apply areas of uh, efficiency to your, your your production by integrating some of those bits now you won't know how to do all of that at the beginning but you will know how to just a- apply a style apply these other factors that that tell a different tale uh, and you know i've seen some really great little shorts coming out that 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 basically augment a normal, a, a, a traditional production shoot with something else, with something else, with something else that that is telling a really unique story uh, or telling it's telling it in an incredibly different way. Uh, and, y- y- you know, the ability for you to shortcut some of those phases. I remember uh, doing some stuff with CGI and doing having to do um, uh, motion control, uh, rigging, um uh, uh distortion and things for for um for your your muscle muscular musculature and then facial rigs and stuff like that that takes months to do but all of those elements and they're not not important to get perfection they're important but actually to shortcut to get you to a, a phase there these are areas where you can tell a story in a quite a compelling way very very quickly and so Th- those bits there are are still for the benefit of the creative and for the benefit of the story. Uh, so jump in, jump in, just keep trying yeah. and get experience where you can. Um, because yeah, uh, most I think most agencies and most production companies should be screaming out for for people who have that capability. Certainly in the next um, uh, two to three years, as we start to define where AI sits in our industry landscape, people with that knowledge are going to be far more. Um, uh, in demand than 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 the random um, usual output from university, college, or apprenticeship. I think that wraps up a very comprehensive, in depth, but really fascinating conversation. I have, I mean, I want to carry on. Um, I may even get you on another time. Who knows? Uh, thank you very much for the. You're very well. And, and experience that you've brought to the table. The one thing that I've t- taken away from this, which I think is pretty cool, is the melding of tradition and the future new. And I think for me that is really exciting as a 51-year-old. You know, I'm a glad that the tradition and the experience is not going to need to be, in fact, it's better to have those two things together. So thank you very much for our chat. I have one last You're question. Welcome. It's a very simple question. We usually ask our guests at the at the end of um, each uh, recording. If you were mm-hmm. to recommend or say, I would really like to see this person on as a guest for Creatives with AI, and I know I've thrown this okay. at you, I didn't tell you I was going to ask this question. Um, would there be somebody that you, it could be a famous person, it could be a colleague, somebody you've known in the past or or somebody you know that you could say, right, you should definitely talk to them. I would be interested in hearing from if you if you do know him, uh, James Somerville. Uh, he uh, was the old school uh, uh, graphic designer for um, uh, a company called Attic, which in the nineties was everybody wanted to work there. They were brilliant. Uh, then he became the creative director of Coca Cola. He um, is now out on his own, but actually 
um, I'd love to hear how he sees the industry changing. He's been a pioneer of how um, augmenting um, uh, like independent thought in terms of like um, crowdsourcing creative. Uh, uh, and, and that is kind of like a little bit like uh, how AI is doing it. So I'd love to oh. see how if you crowdsource 50, what happens if you crowdsource 5,000, 5 million and, uh, and, and how that's uh, affecting what he's doing now? I love that. OK, I'm going to try and reach out to my network to see if I the name rings about. I'm sure I've probably met him. Um, come across them at some point in my agency world. So, look, thank you very much for that. Um, thank you to all the listeners for listening today. And um, I want to encourage everybody to stay curious because I think that is the answer to where AI is going. So thank you very much, James. And, um, yeah, goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye.